Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Um, my name's Dave, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Dave. I'm terrified tonight. I don't know why, but um, this is a new meeting for me, so um, this is not my normal Saturday night meeting, and I love routine. Um, yes. So, uh, yeah, and it's really ironic because I live a few blocks from here, and I always complain about how there are never any meetings in Emeryville because there aren't, and <laughs> this is so close. It's not Emeryville, but it almost is. Um, so, yeah, it's really good to be here, and thank you, Cassie, for asking me <laughs> to speak tonight. Um yeah, so and it's funny being in a Methodist church because my dad was a United Methodist minister for wow. forty five years, nice. and he's retired now. Still, he's still living with my, um, he and my mother. My mom was just put in assisted living, and so there have been some life challenges lately. Um, and they were living apart now for the first time in sixty eight years. So it's, it's a little weird. They're ninety one and ninety two. So, um, but I didn't drink over that, and that is kind of a miracle. Um, since I'm um, speaking first and, and briefly, I kind of thought it would be um, symbolic, I guess, since I'm at the beginning of the meeting to talk about my beginning sobriety um, and what worked for me. Uh, my sobriety date is February 11th, 2013. So on the 13th of this month, I'll have six years and six months. Oh, yeah. um, so it's been great. I got sober in North Brooklyn. Um, I remember the day really well. Um, it was gray and cloudy. It was a February. And I remember just feeling at the end of my rope and I tried everything. And the, and I, I remember reading every piece of alcoholic literature there was to read. Okay. I'm exaggerating, but, um, but I read a lot, like all these memoirs about people that like in their drunk time. And I had my favorite bar that I always go to and I'd read these things while, you know, drinking beer and not talking to people. And, um, so yeah, and I remember, and I, I, been married for 20 years and my husband is uh so he's seen me through lots of binges lots of dry goods sobriety more binges more dry goods more sobriety and this one stuck for some reason um so far so um you know one day at a time right and you know i think I remember the first meeting going downstairs. I had played hooky from work and I knew that there was a meeting and I, I kept telling myself it was just too far for me to go. It was like eight blocks. And I just, you know, who's going to walk eight blocks to go to a church basement. Um, and I ended up doing it. I was walking around and it was almost like it was weird. There's some higher power stuff going on here. Cause it almost was like this gravitational <laughs> pull that pulled me to this meeting. And I remember hanging out outside. It was like, I got there like 40 minutes early and I was just, and it was cold. And finally I went downstairs and, and I sort of, I remember feeling really out of place and really at home at the same time, which was a really strange feeling. And I remember thinking to myself, I don't know, cause I normally work during this time. And part of the, I, I can tell part of my program is going to need to be connection, right? Cause that's for me, sobriety is as much about, you know, all the work that we do in here. It's as much about connection as it is about any of that. It's about me seeing you and you and you and you and, and, and knowing that you're here and knowing that we're here to help each other. And that to me is really powerful. And so I felt like I should come back to another meeting. So I came back to a meeting that night with the intention of like talking to people. And it turned out to be a meditation meeting, um, pitch black with um, maybe a couple of like holiday lights up. And we had to sit in silence for 20 minutes and, um, and then people, it was a Quaker style meeting. So people would just go hand raising. Thank you. And, um, yeah. And two guys came up to me after that meeting cause I had said that I was new and I don't know what I would have done if they hadn't said this, but they said basically what meeting are you going to tomorrow night? And that changed everything. And they said, there's this new meeting. Um, and it was with a sassy name that I'll tell you about if you wanted to ask me after the meeting, but um, not a approved, but um, the meeting was, but I ended up going to that meeting. And then I found myself going to a meeting every, pretty much every day, sometimes more than one every day. 
And that really started in 90 and 90 for me. And I'm a big advocate of the 90 and 90. I've done probably five of them or six of them, maybe. I'm not sure. Um, most recent one was last October when I felt like I wasn't, I'd moved here three years ago and I just felt like I wasn't getting a foothold here. And I did a 90 and 90 and it changed everything. Like suddenly I felt connected. Suddenly all the faces started looking familiar. Suddenly I knew people's names. Suddenly people knew my name and asked, started asking how I was. Um, and then I got a sponsor, started working in steps again. Um, and, you know, there were just little things that, that, that have helped me stay sober that I'm really grateful for. Um, step work, obviously sponsorship, obviously I've always tried to do at least one or two service commitments a week and I'm doing that now and it feels good. Um, somebody told me about halt, never get too hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. And so I learned to always carry protein bars in my bag so that if I'm stranded, I'm not going to get hangry. And then that's going to make me want to just take a left turn into a bar. Um, cause that's how I am. And that's how my mind works. And that's how I get even with the world for all the cruelties it bestows on me. Um, and so, yeah, it's been a really great ride and, um, I just finished graduate school um, after 30 years out of the educational system. <laughs> and and it's a gift of sobriety because sobriety has taught me, I used to have all these delusions of grandeur, like, oh, I should win an Oscar even though I don't act or direct or whatever. Uh, but they should just give me one because I deserve it. And, and really what sobriety's taught me is just showing up every day and doing the work. And that's, it sounds boring, but the rewards start coming, came, started coming for me really quickly. And so... Um, I'm really grateful to you all. Um, yeah, and it's really great to be here. So thank you for letting me speak. Hi, I'm Diane, alcoholic. Hey, Diane. Hey, Diane. Thank you so much. What a wonderful share. Um, as I'm sitting here between two strangers, they will become friends. That only happens in AA that I know of. It's wonderful. Um, and, and the comfort level is just so amazing. Um, I'm more comfortable in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous than in my own home. Speaking of which, um, I just moved. I am, I'm a room renter. If anybody rents a room, you know you're going to be dealing with some people that you're renting a room from. And they, it, it's always different. And it's weird, but because of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm able to fit right in like a glove. And it's not in a codependent way. It's in a way, it's in a way of um, just being really present. I've met so many wonderful people here at Alcoholics Anonymous, and we're all different, and we have different stories. Uh, we have a different play, you know, but it, it, a different script, but it's the same play, you know. Um, anyway, I'm just delighted to be here, and Oakland is a place when I moved from Chicago when I was two years sober, um, I lived in Martinez Walnut Creek, and I always came. I actually started to go to San Francisco. I was really, I said to myself, you know, I need to be in a city meeting, not a country meeting. So at two years sober, I judged that. And um, and I tried over there, but um, I would drive to San Francisco a lot, and, and that was... Um, you know, 24 years ago, I have 26 years sober. So it wasn't that trafficy as it is now, but, um, Oakland has always been a place of, um, that I've had different meetings that I call my home group. So, um, it's wonderful to have all these meetings in the Bay area and we really are connected and we're connected everywhere in Alcoholics Anonymous. Some of my favorite meetings were in New York and, you know, the rainbow room. And, um, I just, I just can't say enough about that place. They have a meeting in New York City in the theater district every hour um, and, you know, 24-7. So um, just just delighted, um, you know, AA's just grown. It's just amazing, and it's still growing. There's no excuse for me not to get to a meeting. Sometimes today I think, oh, you know, I don't need a meeting because my life got larger. You know, I get to do wonderful things. I get to spend time with my kids, spend time with my boyfriend. Um, I have a, I mean, it sounds like, it sounds like a fantasy. You know, I have a wonderful job. I didn't pick the job, by the way, when I was, um, a year sober, um, one of my ex-husband's friends said, Hey, your wife plays the piano. Could she teach my child you know, piano. And I said, Oh God, no, I don't teach. 
and I just played and I shut the door when I played so nobody could hear me. But I played all my life. I mean, I was an addictive classical pianist and I, you know, I played hours and hours a day. And I, and I, and I remember saying, no, you know, I, I'm not going to do that. And, and then they asked me again and I said, okay, I'm just going to go ahead and do that. And I remember teaching that kid you know, when I'm sober here, Mary had a little lamb and I knew that's what I was supposed to do. And I had to get myself out of the way. It's not my will. It's God's will. And that is the, that is the thing that I, I don't talk about that a lot, but that's the thing that I really feel here when I'm in my will. I don't know about you guys, but it doesn't feel right. It feels really self-centered. Um, so I started drinking at um, 16. Before that, I had an eating disorder. They called it they call it bulimia now, but they didn't have a word for it back then. So I was horribly confused. But the drink one year later made me feel better. And I started drinking. And this was, um, you know, in the 70s. And um, discotheques are now popping up all over Chicago, as well as the corner bars. And I drank in both. But I love the discotheques. I love to dance. And um, I, I also felt if I'm not sitting at a bar drinking, I can't be an alcoholic. If I'm on the dance floor. And many times I fell down on the dance floor or fell into a tray of tequila sunrises. You know, the waitress was down there. I, I mean, I had those moments. And, um, and it was really because, hey, I was just spinning around uh, like a top. But um, uh, Saturday Night Fever had just come out. And, um, you know, I was part of that. But, but that, was, that was like a blink of an eye. It didn't last that long. I don't know if you guys remember that disco. It just was, it came and it went. And and it's, and I got married. I met my, my, I met both of my husbands in a bar, not at the same time, of course, but I met my first husband and um, he was walking by a bar that I worked at because what was happening for me is, uh, you know, I didn't really need to play the piano anymore. All those wonderful novels that I read as a kid, I kind of gave that up. Um, whatever it is I wanted to do, I kind of forgot what that was. I tried to stay in college and congratulations on getting that mass, that doctorate degree that, or whichever it just, you know, it's amazing. And the the things that we can do in sobriety. And I I kind of, um, didn't have a, um, I didn't have a plan anymore. Well, okay. I had a plan. My plan was to party (laughs) (laughs) and I'm partying on the weekend. But what happened on Monday through Thursday? No, Sunday through Thursday. Well, Sunday I took off. And it's like I used to go to the bar and just sit there on Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night. And by this time, I'm 17. And welcome, Michael, to the area. You've just moved here uh, from Virginia. You've been here three weeks, and it was wonderful to talk to you. And we were talking about Wisconsin and Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And when I first didn't have a, couldn't get in, you know, they changed the drinking age in Chicago. So I drove up to Wisconsin. What a long way to go from Chicago to get a drink. It's an hour and a half ride. And um, and the bars weren't the same. I, you know, and in Milwaukee, it's kind of cool. We were talking, you know, if you've ever been there, all you have to do is put a, put a, a bar sign, a sign that says bar or tavern in your window, because that's where the bars were. They were in people's houses. Oh, and wow. there was a block, there was a bar on every wow. block and a church. We, we talked about that. Uh, yeah. So it was funny, but then I realized I could get a fake ID and that's what I did. Um, I started working in the discotheques and again, everything kind of went haywire. Well, I met that first husband. Uh, he was walking by, by the way, and uh, it was walking by the bar I was working at. And, you know, I, I don't know this, you only hear this in Alcoholics Anonymous kind of, but we got married like shortly thereafter, you know, just like walking by. And he said, you want to get married? And I'm like, sure. Cause I, he was Cuban. He was a baseball player, and he came from this country. He was very proud to be here. He was a wonderful guy, loved the Cuban culture, loved his family. And also, I wanted to go down the aisle in the Spanish wedding dress. And that's a true story. And that's the vanity that I had, you know, back then. That I that I hope I don't have now. Um, we had a huge wedding, and um, 
our wedding reception was a little like West Side Story, and I get to say this because my relatives were Polish, and they did a lot of polka, and then his relatives were Cuban, so they came out and they started salsaing and doing all the great dances, and um, it was it was kind of like who it was kind of like a war, a dance war. Um, I couldn't get a drink that night. That's when I remember about my wedding because the best man. I asked him to get me a drink. And I drank vodka tonics, and he got me a vodka gimlet, and that, that um, lime juice, because I didn't eat back then. I just drank, just burned my esophagus. I remember just going and throwing up, and, you know, this is what I remember about my wedding. So there's something wrong with that, but... I don't know that I'm an alcoholic yet, you know. All I know is, uh, you know, and I went to we went to Hawaii, and I can't tell you that I remember it. I don't remember it, um, and it, and it was because I was drinking, you know. So um, we had a child there shortly thereafter, and um, by the way, my drink of choice was wine. I always felt that it would be okay to be to have a glass of wine, not that I ever had a glass of wine, but it was just, it looked better if you had kids and you're a professional person and, um, and I got sloppy and I broke all those wine glasses in the house and was drinking out of paper cups and bottles and you guys know the story. So, um, we had the uh, daughter and I basically, um, my our daughter was raised by his parents because of the fact that you know in Chicago it snows and it's cold and I was working full time and it was really really too much trouble to go pick up my daughter after work mm. and to come home and to take care of her and go back because I wanted to stop off downstairs at City Tavern you know and drink with the guys or drink with the people and it just wasn't working out. We hear that in Alcoholics Anonymous that we sacrifice. Uh, some of us will sacrifice our loved ones, our children. I have a friend, uh, Concord Originals, who basically signed away rights to his son so that he could drink. So I kind of signed those rights away to her. Um, and, uh, yeah, so um, I'm going along and... Um, I'm working full time and I'm making a lot of mistakes and seven and a half years into that marriage, uh, you know, we were fighting and I found a, I found a way out and I remember him saying that let's go to counseling and I, and I had already gone back to the bars. So I already got the taste of that life again. It was easy for me to sacrifice the husband who was a hardworking, wonderful guy. Um, and you know, my daughter for the drink, because what happens is, as I mentioned before, and we hear that we start to give up everything that we love and the things that we know, because alcoholism is a rapacious creditor and it bleeds us of all self-sufficiency. So at the end of my drinking, Oh, I forgot about the second husband. So we got a divorce, and I met the second husband. Now in Chicago, we have what's called clubs. So I met my second husband at Clubland. And again, shortly thereafter, meeting him, well, I got pregnant, and we, uh, we got married at City Hall. It was just the right thing to do. Um, and it is kind of funny. It's like we never, I've never talked about, um, I think now, if I were to get married, I would, or think about getting married, I talk to the other person and say, make sure we have some stuff in common, you know, none of that <laughs> ever happened. <laughs> it was like very random and, uh, it's funny. So, so I, I met, uh, Mike and Mike, um, was a gambler, but I didn't know it was a gambler. So, um, I would pick a gambler, but he would pick an alcoholic and a bulimic. You know, I mean, it's not just about what, you know, it, who I got. It's what he got, too. We had two children, and at that time, I decided to stay home and raise the kids. Um, I was miserable. I just remember stuff happening, um, and, you know, I just, I just brought the vacuum cleaner out. I couldn't cook. I just ended up on the couch, and I had paranoia, panic attacks, we lived across the street from school, and I couldn't get the kids to school on time. Right across the street. 
There was the kindergarten mobile. There was the preschool over there. And there was my older daughter from that first marriage who was across the way. And I remember um, running around, running over because it was teddy bear day. You know, they pass a, a, a sheet out and says, it's teddy bear day. Um, you know, whatever day it was, um, February 13th. And, um, you know, and then I ran across the street with that teddy bear. And at that time, I had two pairs of lime green sweatpants that I own. That's all I own because that's what I thought of myself. And one of them had turkey grease on it because the previous Thanksgiving, I pulled the turkey out of the oven and spilled that grease down my leg and ended up in the ER and had had so much drinks that night, um, I didn't even feel it. But that's what alcoholics do. The housewife who stays at home, the mother who stays at home. That's what we do. We get into these crazy accidents. Um, I uh, passed out and my when one of my daughters was an infant and she got into the desitin. We've been in the ER. I couldn't get to the ER one time because I was too drunk when my daughter had an asthma attack. On and on and on, ad inf- infinitum. Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> on and on and on. And um, what's happening for me now is um, I'm pushing one of my daughters at the park on a nice summer day. I'm supposed to be enjoying myself, and um, and I wanted a drink. And it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and that drinking time is going up and up and up because I said I was only drinking after work. But it went up and up and up. It's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I want a drink. And and I'm seeing like five. I'm, I'm pushing my daughter on a swing, and I'm seeing five swings because I'm hallucinating. You know, and I'm having, you know, what's called, um, you know, that craving for a drink. I'm having DTs, not knowing it. And then I looked at this guy and he was pushing his kid on the swing and he, he looked like he was a drinker. So I said, wow, I just can't wait to get home and have a drink. And he said to me, oh, he said, I used to do that too, <laughs> but I don't drink anymore. He proceeded to 12-step me, mm-hmm. and I tried to get the hell out of there as fast <laughs> as I could. <laughs> Fortunately, it was only a hop, skip, and a jump at home, but I'll remember that. That was a mustard seed. We have a meeting in Chicago called the Mustard Seed. It's a great place where people come together um, you know, from all over the different neighborhoods, and um, it's just a great place. And so that was that mustard seed. And what would happen for me is the roads would cross. I'd have that moment of clarity. It's like I was riding a bicycle this way and everybody was going that way. And all of a sudden I'm riding it this way. It's like I'm on a train and I cross to another track and I'm going now along the right way, but I don't even know it. So it's April 15th, the night before um, I had some horrible DTs, and, and let me backtrack just to a couple months before that. I, Like I said, I was on the couch, couldn't get the kids to school, and then um, I had, I'm on the couch, and I, and I felt better. So I said to the husband at the time, you know, I think I could have a, a drink. <laughs> Not that I ever had one. Could you go out and get a couple bottles, a a bottle of wine? I said, a bottle of wine, and then I'll make a nice dinner. And he was happy to do it because he was going to go out and gamble anyway. I mean, that's what he did. You know, that was our thing. So we were emotionally detached from each other. We lived for our addiction, and my um, my husband was Carlo Rossi, you know, and, <laughs> and, and his was Blackjack or whoever, you know, or uh, anyway. So I, um, I said um, – that I could do this. And I made a real nice dinner and we poured the, the bottle of wine and we had two glasses of wine and, um, I was going to do it. I was going to have the one drink and dinner. And I had one sip of wine and that's when I knew that I needed to have that whole bottle. And I started, plus I had to have more. So I gave him my dinner cause he liked to eat. He was pleased. <laughs> So I gave him my steak and I had his wine and set him out for another bottle. And, um, and, you know, and, and that's, that's kind of the way it was. It talks about that in the book, step up to the bar and try some controlled drinking, go up to the bar. If you think you you don't have a drinking problem, then order a drink, drink half of it, 
and walk away. It's not happening in my story. Did not happen in my story ever. Um, although, you know, I wanted it to. I wanted to drink, they say, drink like a gentleman. I wanted to drink like a lady. But, uh, you know, that wasn't going to happen. So it's April 15th. It's 1993. And I wake up in the morning and um, I open the yellow pages and I called Alcoholics Anonymous. Then I started talking to somebody. That person was an alcoholic, too. Uh, I would find my first meeting, and someone would call me back from my neighborhood. Her name was Patsy. It happened to have been her 22nd year sober that day, April 15th. So it was her anniversary, and she called me on this 12-step call. And I said, thanks for calling, Pat, but I'm going to go to a meeting downtown. We lived in this uh, neighborhood called Bridgeport, about 10 minutes from downtown. And I didn't want to go to a meeting in my neighborhood. I didn't want to run into anybody. Not that anybody knew me. I never went out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those days of going out, <laughs> that was, and I had the blind shut. And um, so we, I, uh, I found the meeting and I got on the bus and I got on the bus and I had my lime green sweatpants on, one of them. <laughs> and then, <laughs> And then I found this meeting downtown Chicago. You know, I used to work down there, for heaven's sakes. And look at me now. Greasy hair, lime green sweatpants. Very, very thin, because I didn't eat. Got on that bus, got off that bus. And, you know, I remember we passed Skid Row. My mom always used to say, hey, that's Van Buren Street. That's Skid Row. That's where all the drunks are. You know, and, and when you grow up hearing that, it's like, okay, I'm not on the street. And you know, you know the story. Um, we're we're in all. We come in from all different economical, social backgrounds. So that that doesn't you know that doesn't even apply. But my mom didn't know. So that's you know that's what she thought. I get to my first meeting, but it's like on the 26th floor. And it doesn't say AA. It's going to say Nooners. It's going to have a triangle on it. But I'm looking for a door that says AA or Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm walking around, and it's a circular floor. And I realize I've just walked around that floor five times, and I've not found the meeting. But there was a triangle. And this is where I get some help from a power greater than myself that I haven't even identified yet. I saw the triangle, and I opened the door. And I opened the door to you guys. I arrived at the meeting early. There was a group of you at a table sitting, and I sat down right with you. And you said, hi, are you new? And I said, I couldn't knew. I didn't know how you knew that I was new. <laughs> and I sat right down with you guys, and I told you about my panic attacks. And then I think I need to quit smoking. And that's what I, that's, you know, that was it. You know, I didn't want to give up that alcohol, so... Uh, one guy 12-stepped me, and he, he gave me a promise. He said, you know, I, I had panic attacks too, and now I don't have them anymore. I've been here not 10 months. So he said, I can promise you if you do what we do, those will go away. That drew me in. Um, so the meeting started, and it was a banker who chaired, and he had... Um, a suit on. And, you know, I used to work downtown, so I was looking pretty good. And I just didn't know what happened. I'm sitting there and they ask if anybody's new and I'm, it's me. And what happened is in that particular meeting, when somebody's new, they go right to the first step. And I remember he was going to talk about the fourth step. So we went to the first step and, you know, let me see if I could get this right, but Alcoholics Anonymous is the only place you'll find the banker, the bank teller, the bank president, and the bank robber all together. <laughs> <laughs> Ching. <laughs> I borrowed that from some speaker, but uh, I thought that, that, and you know, it applies, hey, it applies to my story. Anyway, and the sign that I saw on the, win on the thing was, alcoholism is an equal opportunity employer, you know, and it, and it sure got me. It had me employed ever since I took that first drink or maybe even before. 
That day, um, I got three phone numbers, which would I eventually have to use. I walked out of that meeting, and I believe I was in step two already and didn't even know it. I walked in in step one, walked out in step two, and um, I went home. And I had my mom come over and watch the kids, and she said, how'd it go? I said, I think it's going to work, Mom, because God's involved. I hadn't mentioned the word God except in in uh, blasphemous ways. I used to say, God damn it, God help me when I used to hug that toilet bowl. So for that to come out of my mouth, that's a spiritual experience that God's involved. And I think this is going to work because I really wanted it to. I just got reminded when I moved because Mark asked me, Diane, where'd you get those ships? I have some ships on this mantle. And I said, oh, I took my wine back to the grocery store. Because you could do that then, on open. I don't know if you can do that now. And I took the wine back and got money. And I saw those ships at the grocery store. And I bought, I brought them. And all the rooms that I rent, I always bring these ships along. You know, it's just a wonderful, um, it's just a wonderful reminder of, um, of what happened. And who would have, I mean, I think mine was a little bit um, like white light. Experience. I hear a lot of people have the educational variety, you know, but mine was white light. For me to take that back, that wine back, after the way I drank, and I drank a half a jug of Carlo Rossi a night. I drank every night. So um, uh, I had a little problem when I got home. I told my husband at the time I needed to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. And yes, 90 meetings in 90 days is just absolutely wonderful. And he said, well, you can't. You have to watch the kids. So I was um, kind of conniving on how to do that. So I, I got a job at the Chicago Stock Exchange, which is right across from my meeting. And just because I knew somebody there, that was a divine intervention. So they hired me. So I got to go to a 7 a.m. meeting and have coffee mm. with you guys. I got to go to the 12 noon meeting and have lunch with you guys. And then my home group became the 3.30 meeting. And to do that 90 and 90, I had to do the 3.30, 4.30, and 5.30 on Saturday because that husband was going to tell me I couldn't go to meetings. And, you know, that was the way it was. That was just the way it was, and that's what happened. So I was willing to go to any lengths, and I didn't even know that I was willing to go to any lengths. Um, and it was wonderful. That became my home group. Then I would eventually go to meetings in my neighborhood and take my kids to spaghetti dinners. Our first Christmas, uh, we sat on a very cold floor in an Alano club on the south side of Chicago where I got sober because my husband gambled all the money for Christmas that his grand, um, you know, because he had that addiction and he's not in recovery. And you guys gave my kids stockings. You gave, and, and the second year, I volunteered at that Alano Club and got to do the same thing. That is probably one of the most beautiful memories that I have, what you guys did about just that group of people. And it happens everywhere. It happens everywhere worldwide. But, um, wow, talk about love. I mean, talk about love. That's just... That's just, you can't even describe it. You, I can only describe love in Alcoholics Anonymous with the actions and kindness that you guys have shown me, you know, and I only hope to, that I can repay that some, sometime. Now, um, I have to do my third step, right? Well, what happened was I came home from a meeting, and um, all of a sudden um, I started swearing and screaming and holding up the butcher knife that my dad left me all this butcher knives because he was a butcher. So I'm three months sober and I'm screaming at the kids. I'm screaming at the husband over what? I don't know. And that's when I realized I have the same behavior, mm -hmm. you know, not drinking. So uh, I fortunately was going to a step meeting and gosh, when I got to step four, it was wonderful. And now I'm four months sober and I'm on step four and I did it. I did it. I loved it. I love step four. It was a Saturday morning at nine o'clock and my kids all took a nap and that doesn't happen because <laughs> they were five, three, one and a half, three and five. So that doesn't happen on a Saturday morning. And I got to do my fourth step and I called my sponsor and she came over and um, I, I had on there something I wasn't going to tell her, but I told her and she did the same thing. So we had that, you know, that camaraderie. There's something on my fourth step that, um, to me, I could even take to the grave, but it's my story. So I get to say that I never let that go. I have to every day try and let that go. Letting go is not letting go. It's a process of trying, of, of just just trying it just because if you you think you let something go 
it'll always come back if, if you haven't. So it's just, and that's where the journey, you know, we don't have that ending. Um, and what happened for me is I had, a, you know, these spiritual experiences on the first year, you know, and they still come along today, except I don't recognize them as much as I did back then. Well, it's one of my daughter's first field trips. So I get to volunteer as a parent. And my blinds were now open. They used to be closed. I'm going to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm going to go on my first field trip with my daughter, like all the other mothers. <laughs> used to, I used to see them across the street congregating. And I was, I was across the street. I was separated from them in every single way you can imagine. So now I've crossed the street and I became one of them. And we uh, took that same bus, the Archer Avenue bus that I took to get to my first AA meeting on our field trip. So here I am with my fifth grade daughter and her classmates, chaperoning. We're going to the Art Institute of Chicago. And there in the back of the bus is somebody from my home group. Uh-huh. Yeah, Todd. <laughs> you know, and that was a marvelous day. It was a wonderful day because what happened for me is, you know, that was the day that it talks about in here that never once have we sought to be one in the family, a friend among friend, a worker of among workers. You know, we always wanted to be on top of the heap or underneath it. I was usually underneath it. These days, sometimes I go on top. It's ridiculous. I need to be, you know, that right sized, having that humility that I have to work for. And, um, it, it, and it talks about in the fifth step that that feeling of God will come into you it, like it never has before. If you're uh, agnostic or atheist, you'll get a, a glimmer of that higher power. It's kind of a feeling. And I got it. Um, and I, you know, I, I just can't tell you that that was the step that allowed me to join the human race. So I... Um, Thanks, Alcoholics Anonymous, and thanks, you guys. Um, onward, ho to the steps. When I was nine, nine months, um, when I was on step nine, I moved here, and I decided not to tell you guys that I hadn't done step nine, but um, I changed my mind. <laughs> you know, I, I probably went to a meeting and heard about step nine, and, and I will tell you that um, that's another big step in my life is the ninth step. My dad left me uh, hard-earned money. My dad was born in 1910, and he, um, he was an older dad when he had me, 47. I was an only child. He wanted me to go to college, but I, I couldn't. I didn't. I couldn't pull together the drinking. I don't know how Dr. Bob did it. You know, <laughs> medical school and drinking. And he um, went to Rush Presbyterian in Chicago. He was a physician there or school there. And um, he left me all this money. And I remember walking into bars and buying the bars a drink with that hard earned money that he left. What a slap in the face. But we do that when we're alcoholic. But we don't do that when we're, when we're in recovery. So what I got to do in recovery is put three kids through college. That's what I got to do in recovery. They've graduated. They have jobs. They get to take care of me. That's what I tell them. <laughs> and um, I tried to go back to school, and I love going to school. The problem is I take all the fun classes. Like, I take the art classes and the, and the creative writing. And isn't it wonderful? We can go to school, and we don't have to get a degree. There's no have-tos or, you know, have-nots. The only thing we have to do is not pick up that drink one day at a time. And use these steps, you know, in the best way we can. 12-step work is great. It goes in different, um, it, it just kind of flows. I just remember um, working with others diligently, taking this book, sitting across from the newcomer in the coffee shop. And now I don't do a lot of that I do other 12-step work, but I notice some of the new people are doing that. And it's like there's a place for all of us here in Alcoholics Anonymous. All you have to do is utilize, you know. We don't analyze in this program. We got to utilize. It's a program of action starting from step three all the way in it. And a lot of people are talking about the book, Drop the Rock, which I refuse to read yet. I just because people are talking about it and, um, and Oh God, I got a, a new sponsor and she goes, Diane, she said, I got this great book. It's called Drop the Rock. I'm like, please no. Cause I'm one of those purest 
not for drugs and alcohol, but for my, what I like to read, yeah, I like, I love the AA literature and I love the history and that's always worked for me, but um, that's just called being open-minded, being open-minded, you know, just being able to go to, uh, um, to a place where I say, you guys suggest something and I say, no, you know, I'm not going to do that. I mean, there's really something wrong with that. And that's because egos come back. Uh, egos come back. Um, and um, I have to push it down, you know, with like, like they say at that carnival, you know, when the head pops up and it comes in all different ways. Um, I'm glad, so glad I met my boyfriend five years ago um, because you know, we have a lot in common, but we're AA pals. And even if we're not getting along, because we don't always get along. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. We got to go to a meeting and he's going to share or, you know, there's going to be some sort of service. Maybe, you know, we do a speaker meeting in Pleasant Hill that he um, he started years ago and we're redoing it now and we get speakers and um, and it's wonderful because AA has a place for all of us, and if there's a relationship problem, go to another meeting. There's enough of them around here, and um, I always get fed. I always get fed from you guys. Um, let's see. What else? Um, dog is God. You know, dog is God. The, 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 the biggest thing for me is resentment. And I remember early on when that husband was gambling, that second husband, and took the credit card, I finally decided to walk our German shepherd. I don't think he had ever been walked, although he had a big backyard out there. But, you know, I just, I don't know. I was going to meetings and doing this and that, and I started walking the dog. Then I started walking the dog at the local, the dogs at the local animal shelter. You know, then I had these spiritual experiences like one Christmas, maybe nine years sober with with Dasher and Dancer. They were two pit bull mixes, you know, (laughs) and I had a spiritual experience with them because they were I was walking one of them and he was stopped right there and he looked up at the sky and he wouldn't budge. And this is a time that I wasn't meditating. I didn't know how to meditate. So this dog's looking at the sky because what was happening, he was pointing. He was part pit bull, part pointer, and way up high, there must have been a flock of birds. (laughs) This dog wouldn't budge. So I stood there, and I'm looking up, and um, I realized, God, this is good. This is nice. I'm like right in the moment. I'm not present. I'm not thinking about the next dog that I have to walk or get to walk. And um, these are wonderful times. And, uh, you know, there was the time in San Francisco when I'm um, nine years sober, a lot of nine years sober here um, in my story, when I, um, I was getting a divorce from the gambler because spiritually we were growing apart. Um, because he hadn't found his 12 step, not because he was bad, not because he, um, was abusive, uh, just because he was sick. And I know about that. So I would have to leave my house, move into somebody else's house and raise my kids from that part because he was violent, abusive, and he didn't want to lose the marriage. It was working for him for a long time. But then what happened was I got sober. So um, I'm going to end here. And what happened is um, I did get that divorce, and I, and I left that house, and I took the kids, and I took the dogs. Yay! <laughs> I did it. You guys helped me. I didn't have the courage to do it, even though when I had this surrender prayer. So I had people from my home group surround me with love and, and things like, I'll come with you. We'll help you. I'll help you. And I had that stuff. So I'm going to the dry dock in San Francisco, and I take a secretary commitment, and I'm all day Sunday out at meetings because I, I needed that. I needed to go out. And then I found myself in a um, in an animal rights group, and it was Save the Snow, Western Snowy Plover, and um, this little bird. You know, it's a little bird. It's a, it's, it's a wonderful bird. Um, and I... I was passing out some literature, and I used to do this when I was drinking. You know, it's funny, and um, it was it was it was an absolutely wonderful day. And then years later, as I'm walking along, I'm walking on Ocean Beach, I'm walking on the pier. I see this little bird, and it's a western snowy plover. And then I walk a few more yards, and there's a statue of the bird. 
you know, um, and these are my stories. These are my, um, these are my pearls, um, which, uh, you know, nothing can take away. Um, it, it's just, it's amazing. And there's going to be a lot more to come. Um, if I'm spiritually awake as give that one to Mark and not spiritually asleep. So I have to do the same things that I did when I first came here. And Dr. Bob said it really nice. He said, you know, service for him was four things. It was sense of duty to help the man who once helped him to give back something that he was so freely given. And because it's a pleasure and it's been a pleasure to be here tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.